Welcome everybody to our class on Fuchsian differential equations. Buenas tardes. Bo tarde. Konnichiwa. Uh, I think you're still muted. Welcome everybody. After this technical problem, now you should hear and see me. Thank you, Chiara, for telling me. Welcome to this class. Buenas tardes. <coughs> Bo tarde. Uh, bonsoir. Or bon après-midi. Konnichiwa, if this is appropriate in Japanese. So we will <clears throat> go on by studying differential equations, trying to find their solutions. And we will do the simple case of Euler equations today. So let me first recall a little bit what we did last time, and then we will go on to <clears throat> construct a basis of solutions of Euler differential equations. So recall. The Vronsky lemma from last time, we will use it again. So <clears throat> maybe to fix ideas, let me denote by O f from u in c to c. So 0 should be a point of u holomorphic. So to be more precise, we take for O the ring of germs of holomorphic functions. So you could write this as convergent power series, germs of holomorphic functions at 0. And <clears throat> occasionally, we will also take O equals formal power series. But for the moment, just think of holomorphic functions. So if we have one schema tells us if y1, yn in O are given, then C linearly dependent. If I'm writing too small, please let me know. And they are linearly dependent if and only if the determinant of the Ronskian is zero, where w of y1, yn was this matrix y1. First row is y1 up to yn. Second row are the first derivatives yn prime, and you go down <coughs> y1, and you just take n minus first derivatives, yn n minus 1. So this will give us the following corollary. By the way, I hope to send you soon the next part of the notes, uh, this should come this week, containing this lemma and also the proof of it. So the corollary is if L in O del is a differential operator of order n, recall that the order of a differential operator is the highest derivative which appears in the operator, then Ly equals 0 has at most n c linearly dependent solutions. So the space of solutions is a vector space over the complex numbers, and it has dimension at most n. So of course, here we take, for the moment, solutions in O. Later on, we will also allow logarithms. But let's keep this in mind that we will have at most n linearly dependent solutions. And actually, we expect n c linearly dependent solutions, but 
including possibly logarithms. So let me prove this. So I will only do one direction. Assume y1, assume given yn plus 1 solution are solutions of, can you still read here, L y equals 0. OK. Then if we look at the, the, at the ground skin determinant with n plus 1 entries, then consider w of y1 up to yn plus 1 and its columns. Maybe I just continue here with columns yi, yi prime up to yi to the power to the derivative n. Now we are going up to n because we have n plus 1 entries in each row. Now we know that Ly equals 0, which implies that they are all linearly dependent. Hence, Their entries, so the entries of such a column, the entries of such a column are all linearly dependent because the coefficients of L are in O. So this implies, hence, the determinant of w y1 yn plus 1 is 0. And now you can apply the lemma and apply the lemma. So I'm going to build some windows here so I don't have to clean the backboard so often. So this was just the warm-up. And the remark is that this also holds if we allow logarithms. Maybe I can still write it here. The corollary also holds allowing logarithms. So You can do several proofs of this fact. You could also use analytic continuation starting by a point at a point outside 0 and then going to 0. But <clears throat> this is uh, well settled in any case. So this is from last time. And now let me recall also what is an Euler operator. So E. Well, let me start with let me start with an arbitrary operator. So L in O del operator. We expand it expand at zero, so we get L equals C I J X I del J j going from 0 to n with certain coefficients c i j in c. At the moment, we are only over the complex numbers. Okay. So we can split this. We look at the differences i minus j. So we write this sum over s in z. We take i minus j equals s, and then c i j x i del j. And now 
here, all these differences are constant. So this is what we call an Euler operator. Operator. The differences are the same of shift S. S is precisely the difference between I and J. OK. Fine. So we can multiply, when we look at Ly equals 0, we can multiply L with the power of x. So without the loss of generality, we may assume that the smallest shift, the smallest shift occurring here in this expansion of L is 0. This is just for notational reasons. So we could write L equals L0 plus further terms which have larger shift. And this will be, as I already said, this will be an Euler operator called the initial form of L at 0. OK? And today, today we will mostly concentrate on solving a differential equation where just this L0 appears. Okay. So already now I have to erase. So before you erase? Excuse me? So before you erase the statement of the corollary, I think it should be linearly independent solutions. It's pretty clear from the statement of them. Yes. This is a typo here. Thank you very much. Independent, of course, yes. Thank you. So I can erase now. I think you understood it correctly, but of course it was not. Excuse me? Do you have any other question with this corollary? Uh, I would, if I remember well, the last week, you showed the Monsky lemma. Uh, using the fact that an operator of order L has at most n linearly independent solution. No? Yeah, yeah, so you are right, but I could give a, another proof of the bound on the dimension using analytic continuation, starting, as I said before, using the theorem of Cauchy Kovalevskaya. So as we yeah, here it's maybe not correct how I argued, but let's accept it for the moment because it will appear in any case later on again and again. Okay? But you're right. One has to be careful here. So if we now concentrate on Euler operators, let me just write E equals, now I, Change a little bit the notation. I will write xi del i, i from 0 to n, Euler operator. And I already defined chi equals chi e of t. I call it the variable t for the moment, so this will be some ci ti falling factorial i equals 0 to n. And recall that t i is t times t minus 1, t minus i plus 1, the initial polynomial. So there's a reason why I write, so t should suggest that we are treating it as a variable. Yeah? We will see why a little bit later. So, of course, uh, we have seen already that e x to the k equals chi of k x to the k. So we have shift 0. And in principle, we could take here k any number in C, this is a condition which always holds. Okay. And then obviously the roots, rho, a root, 
of chi of t in c implies that x to the rho is the solution of e y equals 0. And now, if the initial polynomial has n distinct roots, if chi t has n distinct roots in C, then x to the rho, rho a root, form a basis of solutions. Okay. Of E y equals zero. And maybe I should repeat what I mean by x to the rho, where now if rho is an integer, it's just the usual monomial. And otherwise, you define this as exp rho times log x. So the interesting case is when we have multiple roots. So what happens? if multiple roots occur. And the many examples I have given you already indicated that logarithms will appear. Expect logarithms. to appear. Actually, powers of logarithms, but it's not clear a priori what powers will appear, how many logarithms will appear, will they correspond to all roots, and so on. And this is the program of today. So I want to give you uh, a list of examples. We did already several examples, but I want to do it again just to show you that uh, simple equations may have quite different solutions. So remark, simple equations may have quite different types of solutions. So some of the examples repeat those we have seen already, but I think it's worth to look at them again. So we take x square y double prime minus x y prime plus y equals 0. This is Euler. of shift 0, as we easily verify. And we get y1 equals x, and y2 equals x times log x. And the initial polynomial chi at 0 is t minus 1 square. And rho equals 1 is a double root. So. To, to explain a little bit my notation, whenever I, I consider the polynomial with a variable, I write t. And whenever, whenever I look at the concrete root, which is an element of c, I write a rho or a sigma. So we see that the, multi, the double root will force the logarithm here. So, we play a little bit like being Lazarus Fuchs in the middle of the 19th century. You look at many examples. Now you take x square y prime plus y equals 0, just order 1. So this is not Euler. But of course, it looks very simple. And we just get one solution, y equals x 1 over x. 
which is, of course, very different from the preceding setting. Now we change a little bit the exponents of this equation. We lower the 2 to 1, y prime plus y is 0. This is now Euler. And the solution y1 is 1 over x. You immediately verify. You just have one, one solution, essentially. And now let us move the x to the other side, y prime plus xy equals 0. This is, again, not Euler. And we get y1. I write 1, even though we just have one solution, to indicate that we're always looking at several. y1 is exponential of minus x squared half. So you see, we have four types of solutions. And it's just fooling around with the exponents of x, essentially. And here we have a second order equation. So let us put some system in all this. And I want to give you a couple of exercises. I will also put them on the website. So, so if, I think it's nice to practice a little bit. Take x squared y double prime plus y equals 0. Then you could take your raise x cubed. And maybe you see some pattern, y equals 0. Then we take x y double prime plus y equals 0. So this, you play around with the exponent of the leading monomial, and then you observe how the solutions will jump. You take y double prime plus y equals 0. Of course, many are classical. And finally, you take y double prime plus xy equals 0. <clears throat> so we will make a cut. We will make a cut in our considerations. We don't want, we don't want to consider equations of this type for the moment, where we have an essential singularity at 0. Okay? So this, what corresponds to an irregular singularity, was discarded in the theory of Fuchs and only considered later on by Fabry. Yeah? So this would be an irregular singularity. OK. So let me come back to this first equation and let us think a little bit about it. So of course, we learn in analysis what the logarithm is, the complex logarithms defined outside 0 and c. But here, when you look at this and these solutions, you observe that actually you don't know, you don't need to know what the logarithm is as a function. The only thing you need to know to solve this equation is the following remark. We don't need to know properties of log x, except we have to know how to derive it, that log x prime is 1 over x. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> Sorry, somebody was entering the, the room, but now it's OK again. So more generally, what 
Once we know this, we can apply the product rule. If we take xi log xk, then we obviously get by, I don't, yeah, maybe I do it, i x i minus 1 log k x plus x i k <coughs> log x k minus 1 1 over x, which equals x i minus 1 log x to the k minus 1 times i log x plus k. Okay? This is, of course, a consequence. And uh, now the idea is Sorry, okay. Professor. Yes? I am missing the left margin, and I am thinking I'm not the only one. You are leading. Left of the board. Here. Right. Okay, yes, I think the, the camera moved a little bit. I will try to fix it. Uh, I will stop here. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. So the idea is replace log x by a new variable, which I call z, with differentiation z prime equals 1 over x. So let me more precise, more precisely, extend the differential ring O with our usual derivative del to the ring. So we have already seen, so we cheat a little bit because we know already what the answer is. We have already seen that at most powers of the logarithm will appear, not power series in the logarithm. So it suffices to consider polynomials in the logarithm. So we extend it to the ring O z, and now I write for the moment del underline, where this is now a derivation here, so this is again a differential ring, where, so how do we define this? Del of x is just 1, and del underline z is 1 over x. Okay. This is uh, very decent. So this uh, del bar is not the, derivative, the usual derivative with respect to z. Note, del bar is not, has nothing to do with dz. Okay. It's a new type of derivative. So we get this ring here, and now we can, of course, we can consider differential operators acting on this enlarged ring. Consider differential operators L in O del. So what is a differential operator? It is a linear combination of higher derivatives with holomorphic functions. So we consider this differential operator acting on O z via, so if this one was C i j x i del j, we replace it by L. For the moment, I underline to emphasize that we are con <coughs> considering a new variable z. So we just take c i j x i del bar j acting yeah, on o z. 
OK? We just replace the derivative with respect to x by this enlarged derivative, where the derivative of that is 1 over x. Of course, as you suspect, this is nothing else but a reformulation of the logarithm. But it's very handy. And actually, for the computations we will do later on, it will be very helpful to it's fine. So this here node for O, if we take formal power series OZ is not Z Z power series in x, but rather c x z. So what is the difference here? We only allow polynomials in z, whereas here, each monomial in x could have a polynomial in z as a coefficient of arbitrary degree. OK, so this one would be larger. So we're only considering this here. So the degree in z is always bounded. Degree in z bounded. OK. So obvious proposition, we have an isomorphism of differential rings. We can take O a joint Z with del bar, and we can go to O where we adjoin log of x and just take the usual derivative, sending Z to the logarithm of x, and that's an isomorphism of differential rings. Okay? The proof is clear. I mean it's obvious. So we will only work with this one here because it's less to write. So I think I should do an example. And then we will come to a very, a little bit surprising computation. The example is the following. We take x square y double prime plus 3xy prime plus y equals 0. So this was in O. I indicate separately. So L, the operator here is x square del square plus 3x del plus 1 in O del. Chi is r plus 1 square, as you easily compute, and rho equals minus 1 is the double root. Similar situation as before. And the L underline, yeah, you just write, you underline all Ls, so that's easy. Plus 1, and now in O, Z, Del. Now you will complain, oh, that's too easy. But you will see in a moment that this is very tricky afterwards. So the solutions of L bar y equals 0 in OZ are, as we have seen already, y1 equals 1 over x and y2 1 over x times z. Okay. So why does this help us to solve Euler equations? Now comes the clue the key computation.
I only do it in a special case, but you can do it and you will find it in the notes in general. Let us compute the second derivative of a monomial in this ring. So compute, find or compute del square underline of x i z k. Okay. So what do you expect to get? So this is of course del underline of the product rule as usual. I copy a little bit because I'm sure that I will make errors. X i minus one. I already put this together, k minus one, and then you get here i z plus k. Yeah, you can check that this is correct. So I have where do I have my computation? Here I have it. And now I want to do it slowly because even though it's boring, it's something which is a little bit surprising. So now I derive again. I hope I can finish on this page and I get. I already factor conveniently x i minus 2 z k minus 2. I have to copy carefully. i minus 1 times z plus k minus 1 times i z plus k. I think there's a parenthesis missing. No, plus up to arrows, but I hope it's okay. X i minus one, z k minus one, i x minus one equal. You just you don't have to copy. It will it will appear in the notes. You will see where we are going. Z k minus two, and then we have. i minus 1 times z plus k minus 1, all this times i z plus k. It doesn't matter what we write here so much. You will see the key point in a moment. We continue x i minus 2 z k minus 2. And then we have to simplify here, and we get i times i minus 1 z square plus i times k minus 1 plus k times i minus 1 times z plus k k minus 1 plus i z Equal i minus 2, z, k minus 2. So here, oh, we observe something. This guy here, I put, put it in red. This one is somebody we know already. This is falling factorial i to the power 2 times z square. And here, the k i and the i k will disappear. So we are left here plus 2 i minus 1 k times z plus this i z goes inside here plus k to falling factorial. And now we can write this as x i minus 2 z k minus 2 i2 z square plus now 2i minus 1 is nothing else than the derivative of this one here. Yeah, so this is i2 falling factorial prime times k times z. 
you see? And here, here you have a one, but you have one half. If you derive here twice, you get a two. K two. So suddenly, by this new derivation, the derivatives of our folding factorials appear. Derivatives. Now, derivative means with respect to our i. Derivatives of falling factorials appear. And this cannot be a coincidence. Of course, we just did the case of order 2, but this should hold in general. What about del bar n? So of course, you expect that also something similar holds. The computation, I won't do it because it's, it's the same style. You just do it once, and then you believe it. What we have done here is, of course, just doing the same calculation with the logarithm. You will agree. So let me write down the general formula in terms of a lemma. Yes. So let t be a new variable. write x to the power t as a symbol. I don't care what it is. With <coughs> dxt. So I want to allow my exponent to be a variable equal t times x to the t minus 1. This makes sense, even though t minus 1 is, of course, the polynomial in t. Further, that, as we did already, t to the j equals t, t minus 1. We had this already several times. t minus j plus 1, falling factorial. And now we want to derive this falling factorial, uh, denote T, J, now I'm sorry for the somewhat complicated notation. So this L means L-fold differentiation with respect to T. L-fold differentiation with respect to T. So this here I should mention Frobenius. Frobenius had the, the idea, as I already explained, to consider the exponent as a variable and to take a derivative with respect to this variable, which is here. So this would be dl dtl of tj bar. Okay, Complicated formula, but we have seen it already here the derivative is appearing. Then I give you the formula. If you take now the j's derivative, underline of such a xt z to the k, then we get the following equal. Of course, we are not going to prove it, but 
it is similar as here. We get Tj that to the J plus Tj prime k times z to the j minus 1 plus, 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 1 over j factorial. I just want to show you that everything is very systematic. t falling factorial, and then you derive j times k j falling factorial. And all this is multiplied with x to the t minus j, z to the k minus j. So <clears throat> if you want to multiply this in, you would get t to the j, z to the k minus j, sorry, z, z to the k plus t j prime k times z to the k minus 1 plus 1 over j factorial t j j is derivative k j falling factorial z k minus j and all this multiplied with x to the t minus j. So this holds in general. So that's the magic of the logarithm, that it allows such a formula. Of course, now you can replace the logarithm, and you will easily verify that this is true. So proof is just a simple computation iterating this. You agree that we are not going to do it. But this has a fantastic effect when we want to solve Euler equations. And this is now the next proposition. Or maybe I should, yeah, so let me leave it for the notes, see the notes. There, I will give you all the details, but I don't do it here. So what does this imply? It gives us the following proposition. So here, here we have just considered one power of a, of a derivative. Now we take a whole differential operator. Let E equals some Ci xi del i, i equals 0 to n be an Euler operator of shift 0. <clears throat> I underline E to denote ci xi del underline i. And now my, I think my stick is fading out, so I have to change the color. I have somewhere, I have a yellow. Let me check a moment. No, I let, me, let me continue with green. Let's see if green works. Yeah, this one is better. So this is the extension to O adjoint Z. Then we have the initial polynomial that chi equals some ci t to the i falling factorial be the initial polynomial of E. And of course, this is a polynomial in t. We can also derive it with respect to t, with derivatives. Now I write these he. What is the index I want to take? j. 
is just C i T i. Derivative with respect to T. Okay? Then and now the everything comes together precisely as we hope. The E bar of now you apply it again to a monomial x to the k, x to the t, z to the k will be you keep the x to the t because you are have an Euler operator, and then you get the first time which is chi of t z to the k plus chi prime of t z to the k times z k minus 1 plus plus plus. And then the last term, if it's not, it could be 0, 1 over n factorial n's derivative of the integer polynomial k n underlined z k minus So now the bells should ring. We see here the derivatives of our initial polynomial. And now if rho is a multiple root of chi, then also some of these derivatives will vanish. So proof follows from the lemma by linearity from lemma by linearity, so there is nothing to show. And the remark is, if rho in C is a multiple root of chi of t, say of multiplicity m rho, n, then chi of rho, chi prime of rho, all these will vanish up to m rho minus 1 evaluated in rho. Okay. So now now you, you get information on the k. Recall that our interest was to get the z to the k stands for the logarithm to the power k. And you are wondering for what k you will get a solution. Now, if k is too large, yeah, here these last terms, you don't know anything about this one in general, but here this k to the <coughs> n falling factorial will be 0. So this one does not even appear. So this gives us precisely the solutions. Moment. Let me write it as a theorem. E in Odell Euler operator and you assume shift zero with initial polynomial chi of t, then Let rho be an, an m rho fold root of chi of t. Then x to the rho, x to the rho log x up to x to the rho log x to the power m rho minus 1 
will be solutions of E y equals zero. So the key here is that we get precise control on the power of the logarithms we need. Okay. It goes up to m rho minus 1. And the proof is, of course, based on this proposition. You just replace, I mean, you could work also with logarithm, but you have to write much more. So <clears throat> uh, extend e to o z and apply the proposition. So I'm a little bit confused. Uh, Yeah, there's a small detail which is to check with these terms here behind. So uh, let me call this star. Maybe I leave it as an exercise or caution with all summons of the right hand side of star. Yeah. These here, so the ones I underline in red, they will vanish. But here in the back, you have to make sure that this vanishes as well. Okay. So now, <clears throat> this as a corollary, you obtain a basis. Yeah. Corollary, varying over all roots rho of chi of t gives us a basis of solutions of E y equals 0. Now you can say, I mean, we could have found this in an easier way, and it's not so deep, and that's correct. But our final goal will be not just to solve Euler equations, but general equations. And then this terminology introducing the variable z will be really crucial. Yeah? Of course, you could translate everything back to the logarithm, but it will help. Now. Um, <clears throat> I want to say one word about the general case. So this is an outlook, which I'm not going to start today. The outlook is the following. If you take now L in O del an arbitrary operator, So not necessarily Euler, <clears throat> then you expand it, as I said before, L equals L0 plus higher shifts So this would be the initial form. And an Euler operator. Then funny things, things will happen, and we will have to study them. So now that we know precisely what are the solutions of L0, Y equals 0, we may hope that this allows us to solve also L y of 0. So. 
then we know the solutions of L0, Y equals 0, say, in O. Now I write again the logarithm. And we know that just these multiplicities will occur. And the hope is, and we hope to lift whatever this means, these solutions to solutions of Ly equals 0. But there happens something quite nasty, and I can already tell you uh, the, the be aware. Now, things become more complicated because the powers of the logarithm we have here do not suffice. So higher order, higher degree, sorry, higher degree, let me just write higher powers of logarithms will or might be needed. So there are two reasons why logarithms appear when you solve this type of differential equation. The first one is that you have multiple roots of the initial polynomial. But then also in the lifting of the solutions of the Euler equation, logarithms may appear. So for instance, uh, you could imagine that all roots are simple. For instance, if all roots of chi of t are simple, and hence x rho rho root is a basis of solutions of L0. Now I write L0 to indicate that we have the initial form, y equals 0. Then you could hope that when you lift these solutions, you don't need logarithms. <clears throat> then the lifting may still require to introduce logarithms. And if you look at the books on ordinary differential equations with variable coefficients, then this complication is often treated just in a special case and not in all generality because it becomes <clears throat> a little bit delicate to write down. I plan to do it in all detail, but the key word here is resonance may happen. So this is just a phrase. Uh, so what do I mean by this? So the, the introduction of logarithms depends on the roots of the initial polynomial taken modulo z. Look at roots rho. So these are in our field of complex numbers. Modulo z. So it could happen may happen that 
for two roots, rho and sigma, the difference in rho minus sigma is an integer. If this is the case, that's what we call resonance, then logarithms will appear. Then new powers of logarithms. And when I say new powers, either because we hadn't have any at the beginning, or because we need here higher powers than just m rho minus 1, then may be needed. Okay. So this is the program of the next session and the session afterwards. Next week, we have holidays, so we don't have a class. I will inform you by mail again. So we meet in two weeks. I hope that I can send you some notes or at least put them on the website within this week. I have to adjust it a little bit to what I was talking about. So <clears throat> I would like to explain to you this phenomenon of resonance. So you see it's just an arithmetic condition on the initial polynomial. And we will see in a quite combinatorial manner why these new logarithms or new powers of logarithms are necessary. Okay? So this is uh, what we want to do next time. So let me look at the time. Yeah, I think we have done enough for today. So please look again a little bit at these extended differential operators. Maybe you try yourself to verify the computation I did on the blackboard. Because the, for me, when I saw it for the first time, I did the computation blindly. And then suddenly, these derivatives appeared. And this gives everything here. Okay. So I wish you a wonderful evening or morning or whatever uh, the daytime is where you are working at the moment. Uh, and we keep in contact. Thank you for your interest. And we meet in two weeks again. I will send you a reminder. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.